You were born in Jamestown? Jamestown, New York, yes, 1926. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Did you enlist or were you drafted? Uh, 71 years ago, the 18th of January, there was 24 17-year-olds that boarded a bus down here at the post office. And we went from here to Sampson, New York. We went to Sampson, New York for naval training for four weeks. After four weeks, we were given a furlough or a, uh, a leave for three weeks, 21 days of what it turned out to be. Came back to Sampson, got on a train, and we were on a train that went from here to the west coast. It took us a week. We came through Jamestown that one night, I remember. And uh, I got out to say goodbye to Jamestown as we were coming by. And uh, we went to Shoemaker, California. It's uh, an outgoing unit outside of San Francisco where they train the Marines for uh, all types of fighting and uh, they were training there when we were there so we thought oh boy we're going to be in the amphibs well it turns out that it was an outgoing unit and uh, uh, different uh, people that went through shoemaker went to different parts of the ship and different parts of the navy and this one morning after we'd been there for s several days uh, there was a list on the board as to who, who was going to leave that day, and there was quite a few of us, about 200 of us, that were uh, told to be at the bus depot at 0800 in the morning for leave to, uh, to board our ship, and nobody knew what the ship was. So we got on the bus and they took us down to Frisco, down out in the harbor there. And we came alongside this huge, huge ship that was there. It was a USS Essex, the aircraft carrier. I had just come back from Rabaul. First in the U.S. Navy's great new fleet of aircraft carriers is ready well ahead of schedule. Completed in 15 months, she's sponsored by the wife of the Assistant Secretary of Navy for air. <laughs> Christened the Essex, she's the Navy's fourth ship to bear that historic name. Most of us wound up in the air division and became Airedales. We worked on a flight deck. We were there for several days, and when we took off, we went out in the Pacific, and we headed for uh, Hawaii. We had to pick up our uh, squadron that we were going to take with us when we went further into the uh, into the war. And as we were there. We uh, had uh, Air Group 9 came aboard and we took them and we went with two or three other ships and went up to Marcus and Wake. They, uh, they were small islands out there in the Pacific farther northwest of Hawaii in Japanese hands. We went there and uh, we were more or less qualifying our air group and they were getting experience by dropping bombs and strafing and learning what they had to learn. We were up there for three days and then we came back after a few days to Hawaii and uh, on that uh, maneuver on our way back, it was the 22nd of May, and that happened to be my birthday. Mm. 
I became 18 years old. <laughs> so I went from 17 to 18, and uh, that was a, that would be in, in 1944. And then we went back to uh, Pearl. We picked up a few other ships, and we all went out into the Pacific, and we came back about a year and a half later, and we had uh, seen a lot of the Pacific Ocean during that period of time. The task group comprised of uh, generally, there was four task groups, and we were number three, the 38.3 .3 task group. And all the task groups were independent out in the Pacific in different places. And each task group consisted of probably two large carriers, two small carriers, four destroyers, or four cruisers rather, and about anywhere from 15 to 20 destroyers. And we're all in a group. And we go across the ocean in that group and you're on your station at all times. And the commands would come from the main uh, ship where the uh, admiral of the ship of the group was, and he would give the commands and they would come to all the ships at the same time. And you can imagine all these ships now going across the Pacific like this in a group, and you could see each other, only thousands of yards between us, and we all had to turn at the same time. So there would be no collisions out there. So <clears throat> the, uh, it would come over the TBS, the, uh, the ships, uh, all, the, all the ships had this information piped to them and the, the command would come stand by to turn to 050. And then uh, a few minutes later, the word would come through, uh, execute turn 050. That's when you would turn your ship. All the ships would turn at the same time so that we're all going in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, an airplane, uh, when we were uh, landing planes and when planes had to take off, they had to maintain about a speed of 30, 34 knots. And uh, our cruising speed was generally around 18 to 24. And depending on the winds and the weather, uh, depending on uh, what, what the circumstances were, uh, we had to turn into the wind to, so that the planes could uh, take off. So then uh, if we weren't going into the wind fast enough, we would all have to turn our speed up to, to meet the demands of the, uh, of the flights so they could, so the squadron, so they could take off. And uh, then we would, uh, they would go up, the whole squadron would take off uh, at the same, not the same time, but one went after the other. Our carrier consisted of, uh, as you can see, uh, carriers is what it does, carries airplanes. The air group of Essex-class ships consisted of four squadrons. Reconnaissance, bomber, and torpedo bomber squadrons had 18 aircraft each. The fighter squadron was reinforced and had 36 aircraft instead of 18. It was a timely decision. These were the fighters who gradually started to win in the Pacific skies. V-2Cs, which were the dive bombers, consisted of a two-man plane, who was a pilot, and then there was a radio man and a gunner, tail and a gunner. Modern Avenger torpedo bombers were the first to appear on the flight decks and in the hangars of Essex-class carriers. Grumman TBF stroke TBM Avenger torpedo bomber. Maximum takeoff weight 18,268 pounds. Then there was the TBMs. The TBMs were torpedo bombers. These uh, TBMs 
were a three-man plane, one pilot, one radio operator, one gunner. And uh, the gunner was in a, in a bubble in the back of the plane. The fighters, they were always on call. We had two catapults on the front of the ship here and here. They were manned at all times. Two planes were ready to go. Fighters would take off first because they could take off on a smaller flight deck. The uh, SP-2Cs and dive bombers were next because they carry a load and they needed more flight deck to take off. And then there was the TBMs, the dive bombers, they were the last ones to take off because they needed more space to take off because of their, the, the weight that they were carrying and the, the size of their plane. They would get to the end of the flight deck when they were, were supposed to see them being taken off like so. They would come off the flight deck and they'd drop down right over the water and then he would take off very slowly and sometimes we'd just stand with our fingers crossed hoping that it would keep on going. Some did and some didn't make it. We lost several planes and men that way where they didn't make it. So that was very frightening and very costly to us. When all the planes had taken off and gone to their destinations, there was always four planes left behind, fighter planes, and two of them were on the catapults at all times. So that if we were surprised by a planes coming in that we had, didn't know about, um, then they would take off and do what they had to do. The reason we had a tough time there in, this, in the first part of the war was the fact that we never had any radar. Everybody thought we had radar all the time. Well, we didn't get radar until when they came back to pick us up, our, the, the, the hundreds of new men. At the same time the Essex was in, in uh, Frisco, they were putting radar on it. And, but there are other ships that had not received their radar. So it took a long time for this to transition to take place. And the more radar that we got, the, the better off we were. Uh, of course, the enemy didn't know that, but uh, uh, it was one of our pitfalls, and we found out the hard way. And eventually, uh, we learned that uh, what, how, how the radar worked and how important it was. Not only our carrier, but all, all the ships, including the destroyers. The destroyers were probably 20, 30 miles from our ship out into the ocean. And they would have their radar, and their radar would go out further. So they were early warning signals. And the, the Japs would be coming in from different angles. And uh, the word would be given to uh, fire at will. And so the destroyers way out there, they would be the first one to start firing on these planes that were coming in. And then uh, as they came in closer to us, the uh, cruisers would pick up and they would start firing and then the battle wagons would start. And then we would too. Our ship knocked down 34 Jap planes. Mm -hmm. The only other ship that came close to us was a, a battle wagon, the South Dakota, and she knocked down 42 planes. And that's a, that's a battle wagon. These are the five inch guns here. And they would uh, throw a projectile that was about 36 pounds, about, uh, you know, they'd, 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 they'd fire, they would set and they would shoot them way up high when the planes come in high. And then there are 40 millimeters, they were, Scattered earth, like there's one here, there's one back here, one up on the bow, and a couple along the side here. And then there was a 20 millimeter. There are the ones that are in these pits here. Mm -hmm. 
so they're, they're fire like so. When these planes come in, they were coming in different directions like so. As a rule, there was probably maybe five or six or more Jap planes that would come in. And uh, so all the ships were firing. Well, as a result of that, our carrier, another carrier alongside it would be over here. Then the smaller carriers would be in between over here and over here. And then the battle wagons would be here and over here. And the cruiser would be here, 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 and here. And the destroyers would be around us. So when they come in like that, at first, everybody starts shooting. Well, it got to the point where we were shooting at each other. Mm -hmm. Nobody had figured that one out yet. And why, I don't know, but they hadn't. So this had to be corrected because we were doing a lot of damage to ourselves and <laughs> our ships and our men and our planes. What happened, they would explode up in the air and shrapnel would fly out about 60, 70 feet from the center of it. And the shrapnel was like this, okay. a piece like that. That's just a piece of it. A lot of that stuff would fly, would come down and fly, and land on the flight decks. And in turn, the tires on the planes would get punctured, and we'd have flat tires on our airplanes. So that whole thing had to be corrected. He said, what we're going to do is take the task group, and we're going to quarter it like so. And when the planes come in on one quarter, all the ships in that area will fire in that direction, same in this direction, and so forth. That way, we would not be shooting at each other, and the shrapnel would not be falling on our decks. That whole firing mechanism and firing in a, in a task group was revolutionized like almost overnight. But all of this had not been figured out yet, and we're still out, we're out there fighting the war. We got things to learn, and we did. And that's how these task groups uh, were so important, and how the aircraft carrier was so important due to the war. So each task group had two big battle wagons. The battleship is huge, almost as long as a carrier. They're, they're, and they carry uh, 14 and 16 inch guns. And they're used mostly for landing operations when the Marines are gonna go ashore. They go in and soften up the shoreline. We're out there with our planes. But late in the afternoon of the day before an assault was gonna be made on an island, these uh, battle wagons, battleships would leave our our group and they would go in and they would be near those islands that are going to be landed upon that following morning and they would pulverize all night long the different shores and when we're where we were we could see the firing it was on the, on the, in the skyline and uh, you can almost, we couldn't hear them because it was so far away, probably 100, 100 miles or so. But they were just over the, the, uh, the curvature of the earth there so that they would be out of, out of sight. But uh, then in the mornings, uh, they would be back on station like they were the day before. But they had their jobs to do at night when they softened up the, the islands before the big landings were. And then, of course, our planes were there to uh, do all the uh, softening up also, uh, different spots, hot spots where the Marines and the, and the Army were uh, ha having uh, troubles. They would call on the Navy, and the Navy would go in there with their planes, and we'd do what we had to do. Um, we had... Uh, Napalm also, which was uh, it's like a jelly, but it's very, very hot, and it's very flammable. 
and that was put in a belly tank and was underneath the, those fighter planes and the SP-2Cs. And they would drop those like a bomb and they would flare out and do a lot of damage. So the aircraft carrier was really needed and uh, we did our job out there many, many times. As a matter of fact, myself, I was in nine different major battles, uh, and that's what these stars are about. There are nine major battles. You know, silver stars for five, and the other battles, other stars are for different, uh, different for different battles, like uh, uh, Iwo Jima, Saipan, Tinian, Guam, Palau, and Rabaul, Tarawa, and we talk the first and second battle of the, of the Philippines. And we went all the way down in the China Sea, and we were, and we had attacks on uh, different cities down there that where we Japanese were, were known to be uh, occupying different cities. And uh, we were down in there, but the thing of it was down in the China Seas, we didn't have very good uh, Chart, charts for, uh, of the China Seas, and we were always correcting charts. That was part of the navigation's job. Was that's what we did? Correct charts, and um, and steer the ship. Eight hundred and eighty-six feet, eighty-seven feet long, the flight deck. One hundred and forty-seven feet across the flight deck. It was built to go through the Panama Canal. That's why it was narrowed down here. And there was uh, 34, 30, 34 ships uh, that were uh, going to be Essex cast carriers. Of the 34, 24 were actually built. So they were all, when you look at this, you looked at the 24, they're all the same. The thing that <laughs> got me was, it still does, is the flight decks were wood, teak. And underneath the teak, was a, well, probably three or four inches thick. And then underneath that, it was a three quarter inch steel plate that they sat on. And then there were expansion joints along the ship here so when a ship was going along and going over the waves like so, you could actually see the expansion joints going back and forth on the ship, just like that. That's all the steel stretching, it's just amazing. With all, see I had a hundred planes on here. Some of them were on the flight deck and some were on the hangar deck being repaired. When the planes came in, they would land back here where the resting gear is. Then they would taxi up and go up here. And then they'd go down number one elevator here, go down on the hangar deck and be serviced, be repaired, whatever had to be done. And it'd be worked on as it, as it went through the hangar deck like so. And then it would come up this elevator here in the back and get stationed on the flight deck and be repaired and ready to go. So the planes came in, they would Come here, hit the resting gear, here and go down. Well, all of those planes were on the flight deck. Now, because the seas were so choppy like this and rolling like so, all these planes had to be tied down. And they had uh, cables going from the wings and from the plane down to the deck. Each one of them had to be that way. Other ones on the, on the hangar deck weren't, uh, at first were not uh, tied down. So they got to the chance where they were sliding back and forth and creating a lot of damage. I was up on the bridge around two o'clock, a little after two o'clock in the afternoon. I was getting ready to get relieved. I was on watch on the bridge up here doing my thing. Uh, on the bridge, we had one hour on the wheel Got a kamikaze, he came in. Well, he came in, number one. He came in and 
went like so. We got him out here. He started smoking out here. He came in like so, went up and around, came around like so, and then he went boom, right there, right in front of number two elevator, right there. And that's where that explosion is. This whole area, he had the bomb right there. Put a big hole in the flight deck right there. All of these planes, all these planes were gassed, armed, ready for takeoff. There's about 70 or 80 of them up there. They were right up to this point here. We got hit here. Had that plane hit here, well, I wouldn't be here. That's all there is to it. But we got the, we got all got burned up on a, on the uh, bridge. Uh, it was chaos up there, actually. The captain, he ducked. He got down on his knees, and on, and the splinter shield goes around the. the, the the, the bridge like so. He ducked down so the flash went over him and the, the doorway is here, the hatch, we call it, door to the outside. That was open and all the ports were open. We had not been secured for general quarters because it happened so fast. And uh, he came in and he hit and exploded, I think it was 17, Personnel got killed down there. Some of them were blacks. Some of them were white. And the guy that operated the elevator, all that was left for him was a was a piece of cable flying in the breeze like so. About an hour and a half, our people repaired the flight deck so that they, we could con resume our operations and our, our planes would take off. And they did. And uh, we stayed out there until the end of the war. So that didn't stop us. But other time, other time we got hit, we got almost got hit. Did I tell you about that? Mm -hmm. time we, well, we got, I was up here, Battle Two. Uh, drop, they dropped a bomb, it was a thousand pounder up here, and like so, dropped the bomb. It went underneath the ship here and exploded, and the ship literally went up in the air like that. And we thought we got hit by a torpedo. But uh, as it turned out, until we had a little time to get organized, we found out that the bomb had gone underneath the ship and exploded and lifted the ship right out of the water, and it sprung several uh, leaks in the in the outside of the of the of the ship, the skin, and those were the, where the fuel tanks were. We lost a lot of fuel oil for our ship, but uh, it wasn't so bad. But what? Because we had other tanks with fuel in it, we could operate with the other tanks uh, with fuel. So we stayed, and we never got that repaired till we came home in the end of the war. Hmm. Where other ships, they went back, we, so we stayed out there. <laughs> but uh, yes, we saw a lot of action, a lot of near misses. We had one time, an old buddy of mine, well, he was, a, he was a bugler also. His name was Tuscushin. And he, we used to have a, come aboard here another station for the for when you go aboard ship and off the ship when you're near uh, shore but anyhow um, he's also the bugler and when they when the bugle blows it's just like when Custer when you, you hear the old Da 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 da, or that one shrill one. That was, that was torpedo defense. They they would play that on the bugle. We'd all hear it. 
scare the pants right off of me on the way he would. He, and old Tootsie played he, uh, that uh, torpedo defense on his bugle, and he ran out on the f hangar deck, and these two planes were coming in like so. They were just skimming over the water, and they both dropped torpedoes, and they were coming right for the ship, and one was for the, they were out here, so uh, one was for the bow and one was for the stern. The two different Bettys they were, they dropped the, the torpedoes. And we see it happening, so the captain says, make a hard left turn. So we turn like so. One torpedo went like this, the other torpedo went like so, and missed us. Wow. <laughs> that was close. Wow. But we were, that's just the way it was. We were so, so lucky in so many different ways that uh, we came through, you know. That was, uh, that was after a, a raid and they came back to the ship and the squadron was, you know. Uh, that was when uh, they came back, when they, they had, they had uh, got into a lot of uh, resistance and there was a lot of heavy air flak from, uh, from being shot at when you met over the target. And they got hit pretty bad. The uh, Franklin got really, really hit bad. As you all know, it was just about... The, the Wasp was there. They had secured from general quarters and as they secured from General Quarters, they all went down to the chow line. And right at that point, a uh, Jap plane came in and dropped an iron piercing bomb. It went through the flight deck, through the hangar deck, through the next deck below, and exploded underneath them, underneath the chow line. And it, it killed 700 sailors. Mm. We were going to General Quarters, and I was going across the flight deck, and we had gone through where the Franklin had gone through the, and the Wasp and uh, the Hornet got hit that morning. Anyhow, the, the water was just littered with men in the water. They were floundering in the water. Some were their heads above water, had, had their life, lab, life uh, vests on and so forth. And some didn't. And as I got up there, I could see that there was a lot that were in trouble and there was nothing we could do and we plowed right through them because we were under attack and we were under a lot of stress. We were going full bore. Uh, anyhow, I couldn't see those guys down there all by themselves in the water. That was heart heartbreaking. I had my shark knife with, I took it out and I cut the release lines on these baskets that hung on the side of the ship so that they were counterbalanced. So if you cut the rope, it would counterbalance and the basket would fall over and out of it would come a, a floating raft. And uh, I cut three of those loose with my knife. It's the only time I ever used my shark knife in the Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, if I saved anybody, I don't, I'll never know, but it was... I felt a little better about it because I had to get up on a bridge and go and be on my watch. This was a one of the situations where when our our planes came back from a, a raid and uh, this is a, a TBM, a torpedo bomber with a bubble in the back here only there's just half a person sitting in here. So we, that's me standing there, and that's the, 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 the preacher, uh, our minister there, giving last rites. This is a blanket we threw over this here, this, this part of the plane. There's Forbrag, the bugler, he was blowing taps at the time. Then we all got and pushed the plane to the fantail and dumped it over the back of the ship. 
so it went into the water. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any time to work on the, on the plane because it was so badly damaged. And he went down with it, of course. But uh, that was a, a sad day. saw a lot of action. We sure did. You saw a lot of friends die. How was your morale? You, uh, well, you, you thank your lucky stars that you're still there. And then you look around and you see such a beautiful day. And you ask yourself, why in the hell are we doing what we're doing? Trying to kill each other. It just can never get over that. I forgot to mention the fact that we zigzagged on the equator when we were down in the southern part of the Pacific. And I went down as a polywog and I came back as a shellback. <laughs> uh, a polywog is a person that's never gone across the equator before. Yeah. But after you've been initiated, like we were, they cut your hair off. They do funny things to you. <laughs> Jeez. And this is the officers, this is everybody. We had military officers aboard. They were observers. They got it too. It didn't make any difference. If you were a polywog, you were going to go through what you had to go through to be a shell back. So we all had to go through that whole ritual. <laughs> But we were actually quartermaster and all. I'll bet quartermaster and all. We actually had a zigzag back and forth on the equator. But the part that really got me was when we were on the equator. It was probably as calm as this floor is. But the debris. I never saw 
a dirty ocean before, but I saw it down there. Really? It was actually dirty. It was full of anything and everything. Dead trees, uh, dead this, dead that, I don't know, just, just floating on top of the water. When you're on watch, and uh, you have to call, call the, the next watch, you have to go down about, say they're going to be on the, uh, tw uh, the, tw the uh, 10 to 2 watch. You go down there about 1.30 in the morning, and uh, you have to go up and down the corridors, or passageways, I should say, and uh, you hear funny noises. You know? I wonder what that was. <laughs> Crap getting away. <laughs> they, they put a blanket down so you wouldn't hear the, the crap <laughs> hitting the steel deck. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes they would roll off. <laughs> but see, the, the master at arms, <laughs> he would be roving all the time. They're, all day and night, they rove. And everybody had to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that'd be in the sack. <laughs> <laughs> only there was some real card game going on, I'll tell you, at night. And, well, it's the only time we had to do things like that. The waiters and the, whatever you want to call them in, in, for the officer's country, we never saw them. They weren't among the crew. Right. They were more or less by themselves, and they were, that's what they did. Mm -hmm. And then it was right after that where Mrs. Roosevelt changed all of that, where they become, they could be fire. Oh, they did man, they did man a, a 20 millimeter because they got killed on one. Mm. One of them got killed, yeah. Other than that, why, uh, there was that feeling aboard when you, when the blacks came up from up down below, they'd come up on the flight deck. On occasion, when the conditions were right, we could go up and get a sun bath or take a sun bath and get some fresh air. Because being down below, you get the heat rash would be all over your body. And because you're down there so much, you're, you're perspiring so much, and you get this red rash on you. And the, the best thing you could do for yourself was to get fresh air or get the sun on it, and you get rid of some of it or hold it back. And they would come up, they were allowed to come up on a flight deck, but they would be more or less by themselves. How could all of those planes be up in the air? And how would a pilot know who's who? Because we all come from different ships and different air groups at different markings. So when these pilots are up there and they're having chasing the Japs uh, and they would encounter another airplane of the same make, but it would be from a different ship and a different signal on the, on a tail. Remember the Black Sheep Squadron? Yeah, yeah. Boynton was top hot dog. Mm -hmm. He was, he, well, they were aboard our ship. We were the first ones to have Corsairs. They were 400 and some miles an hour compared to our F6Fs. The Japs were really afraid of that. F4U. The only thing wrong with the F4U was they had such a large fuselage they could hardly see where they were going when they were taken off. We all got the purple harp on the bridge that got burned. Mm -hmm. Hands, face, neck, arms. We were not at condition one. We were not at uh, condition two or general quarters when we got hit. It was just right out of the blue, bang. Otherwise, we would have been more prepared. We got burned up pretty good. Gosh. Our hair got burned off. Everybody crowded into the, there was no room in the pilot house. When we, everybody dove for the pilot house that were up on the bridge. The one time I was going across the flight deck up there and I, <laughs> we were under attack and this plane come in, he was strafing. And, uh, He's coming in right across uh, 
I was standing right there. I'd come across here. I was standing right there. The plane came in like this and he was strafing and he shot about a foot up on my head like that. Wow. Somebody was with me that day. I was standing on the bridge here one night. We were <clears throat> a beautiful night. And then hanging on a bridge and we were just doing normal cruising and this man comes up on the bridge and he had a felt hand on. <clears throat> <laughs> Uh, he starts talking to me, he's a sailor, he says, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I says, I'm a quartermaster. I'm, uh, I got to watch tonight. And he, we start talking back and forth. And, and he, I don't know how it happened, but he, his, he said, oh, by the way, he said, my name is Bird. And I said, oh? Uh, uh, he said, you heard of Admiral Bird? And I said, yes, I have. And I said, well, I'm Admiral Bird. <laughs> He reached over and we shook hands. <laughs> I never saw the guy because it was dark. But he had a felt hat on, very nice spoken man. And, well, you never know. <laughs> Pretty big deal. <laughs> yeah. But we were CV-9 right on, on the flight deck here right. and here. So when our planes come in, they could spot our... <laughs> and at night, these poor guys, they only had eight lights shining straight up. Otherwise, all the ships are darkened. Right. The only thing they can see out there is a wake, which is almost as luminous. And then those eight lights on the flight deck shows where the flight deck is, and they have to land on it. Some did and some didn't, right. especially when they were low on fuel. Right. See if several of them ditch as they go in the water, run out of fuel. Sometimes they were real bad crashes, and they would pull, pull the pilot out. They were right there with their, they were ready for them. So if there was a mishap, why they'd be right there with a stretcher. World War II in the Pacific, four years of bloody hell, came to an end here. September 2nd, 1945 a solemn ceremony on the deck of the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. A mighty warship and a peace to celebrate. Oh, we were right next to the Missouri. That's what I yeah, we stood there and watched the whole thing in our binoculars. They were right down below there. We were there. That's the day we went home. Feeling on the, on the ship. Well, you can't believe what's happening is happening. You know, you just, you're there, yeah. <coughs> You, you you have to think on it real hard, and then, and then it'll kind of sink in a little bit. But when you're when you're there looking at it and seeing it, and you're there, uh, it's hard to believe that history is being made at that particular moment, yeah. and you're there with it. Saw a lot of that, you know. Did you pop a cork or something? <laughs> no corks to pop. <laughs> <laughs> well, when our planes. When over Tokyo, the day they signed, they, they declared peace, our planes were about to go over and drop bombs. They got the word, the war is over. They turned around and dropped all of their, jettisoned all of their bombs into the, into the ocean. And they came back to the ship and landed in the war. Well, I emphasize it all the time. They should honor and respect that flag. I don't care who or where, but they should. Really, really, and they should really think about Memorial Day and days like that. What's the message you think today's youth should take? I'm just one of those believers, that's all. I'm, I'm sold on when I was in the service. This was my home for two years, and uh, I thought the world of it. I really did. I'm so happy that I was there and did what I did and saw what I saw. And I saw it all. I saw a lot. There's a lot of officers aboard our ship. I'm only a quartermaster, third class. 
And I was so darn happy to get that third class, you cannot believe. Of all my achievements, that's the one thing I achieved and I really, really, really uh, thought a lot of that rate and what it stood for. And we were up on our bridge. I was right up where all the, all the captains came aboard, all the admirals came aboard. They'd come, they'd see, the, <clears throat> the captain, once he's underway, when a ship is moving, he cannot leave that bridge until it stops someplace else. So he's captured in that little room up there all the time. Uh, we had admirals on board. They were, they were stationed in the deck below in another office. But if they wanted to talk to the captain, the admiral would come up to see the, the captain. The captain didn't go to see the admiral. Well, to, to Bill Peel. <laughs> <laughs> ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. That really was an amazing lesson. <laughs> wow.